Welcome to the Thought Leadership Podcast, where we share insights on how you can become the go-to thought leader in your niche. I'm your host, Alejandro Sanoja, founder and personal branding consultant at Latin Presarios, and today our guest is Andres Gonzalez. Andres has been working for more than nine years in e-commerce and banking companies as a strategic data and financial analyst. He's a great team player, always eager to keep learning and find new challenges. Andres has a master's degree in business intelligence and technological innovation, plus a minor in project management. He's also a master in sports management in Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, Spain. And right now he is the pricing lead manager at Hello Print. Andres, I'm so happy to be having this conversation with you because I want to talk about building thought leadership as an immigrant in a culture that it's not your own, in a language that it's not your own. It's it's already difficult to stand out, to position yourself as a thought leader and have people come to you for the problems that you can help them solve. But on top of that, dealing with a different culture in a different language, of course, makes it a little bit harder. So I'd like to learn from you, how was the journey of going from Caracas to Barcelona, and now you are in Rotterdam. Talk to us a little bit about that journey. Yes, so well, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for, for having me again. Uh, long time no see. I think uh, it's been a while since uh, we've, uh, we have a uh, talk. And, uh, yeah, so it's super nice to be here. And um, yes, it's not been an easy journey for sure. Um, so I, I have to be honest, I'm a super big fan of Venezuela. Is uh, somewhere where I, I really want to stay, but the situation, like many of us know, have uh, mm -hmm. required for us to to look outside. So um, basically, my first uh, when I moved, in, my first decision was to move to Barcelona, Spain, based on okay, let's do a master in uh, sports management, something that uh, I really like. I really enjoy sports, and uh, yeah, and let's see, it's also Spain. Uh, I'm super lucky because uh, I have the Spanish nationality, so that make it. Uh, super easy just to find uh, uh, opportunities there in the, in the universities and uh, while I was doing the master it was also easier to find a job there so I can't complain in that sense I'm super lucky compared with uh, so many other friends and uh, I have a lot of gratitude uh, uh, because of that uh, so yeah in, in, and you can imagine that uh, yeah going to Spain yeah in Spanish and Venezuelans we have a lot of things in common but when you really go to that work environment, and especially in Barcelona, where actually you see that uh, the Catalans are all should be, be more have more strong characters than any other Spanish community, let's say. Uh, it, it, it is, to start with, was a, a bit complicated to adapt. Um, but then, well, you, you try to really be humble and try to make sure that, yeah, you're not the one that knows everything because, yeah, I, I already had my degree in Venezuela, I had two years of uh, experience uh, or well, I, even three of a corporate. And then you come to, uh, okay, you have to start from the beginning and uh, be humble and understand also, yeah, what are things? What are, what, what are other people think, right? And how they react and uh, how they understand also your message. So it all started with that. And I think, um, again, then in Spain, it took me less a time to really adapt to how uh, the work style, but then I think it, uh, going more to a more international environment. So the first uh, companies where I worked were more uh, with a lot of uh, Spanish. So actually I didn't even have to speak much English. And then I had to the opportunity to start in an American uh, company as a Vista print. And then I had a diverse team of uh, Spanish, Swiss, uh, English, um, uh, Swedish. So all around the world. So then again, that started to be a bit more complicated because yeah, when you want to transmit a message, it's also a more uh, complicated um, or to convince another one uh, during work, for example. And then, uh, and, uh, but I really think, and this is the, like the, 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 the value or where I really saw the, the difference in the culture was coming here to Rotterdam. When I came to Rotterdam, uh, you have to, uh, I started working with directly or report directly to uh, my elites that were Dutch. And the Dutch culture, as we all know, or it's already famous for that, is a stereotype that they're super direct. 
They're super straightforward. And yeah, and that's uh, super efficient. But if you're not used to that, you will maybe have a hard time. Uh, but not only that, because then, yeah, so my, my leaders, let's say my management, where I had to report, were Dutch. And then my team, we were seven nationalities. So Venezuela, India, China, uh, Argentina, Russia, uh, British, Spanish, and Dutch. Uh, yeah, and I had to manage my team and I have to understand and make sure that the communication in the team was, uh, it worked because everyone had their own style. So that's I think that development, it's uh, been super interesting and I'm, I'm a big fan of that. So I really like to read this kind of book. So the, one of my top, top books is the culture map. So I don't know if, uh, if you have read it, but it's one of my top books where you can really understand, yeah, the perception of things into different cultures and how important it is to understand that. And again, as how to give feedback, how to communicate, how to uh, pers uh, persuade others, how to, uh, what, what is time for one culture and for another culture. So, I, so my message here is always, it's all about empathy and understanding others and uh, being open to other cultures and understanding that everyone have their own world. And, uh, and then you have to really make sure that you can make the, mo the most of it. And, uh, and when you combine everything, then you really have those uh, high performance team because each one of us have, uh, so what I try to do or try to find is the best thing of everyone. And if you combine that, yeah, for sure, you're gonna have a high performance team. So I think that's been like, a, well, again, in a nutshell, like a kind of a, my journey between the different cultures I've uh, have encountered. Yeah, and you kind of, you went from the extremes um, because if the Dutch are direct, I remember I had trouble a little bit here in the US whenever people would send emails or text messages because they're, I felt they were super direct, but I imagine they're probably somewhere in the middle compared to Venezuela, right? That people, they first ask about how you're doing, your family, and until at the end they ask you, they tell you what they're gonna tell you. Uh, yeah. Same with same with time. I remember here it was it was weird for me at the beginning that when people would invite you to their home, yeah. they they would say two to four, and at four everybody would leave. Yeah. Kind of like clockwork. It's four. It's time to leave. And of course, we know that in Venezuela it's the opposite. <laughs> it's a it's an opening when you have. Uh, something, a dinner, a party, a birthday, it's an open invitation to come anytime after the time you say, and then, and then you can stay forever. Now, I'd like to, I'd like to ask you about how to, how to be open to all those different nationalities and personalities and how to understand them and how to help them. Because I find that in a way, it's good here in the U.S. for me. I find that I my judging screening it's kind of like turned off because you don't know how to put people in a box. Right? Yeah. If you're in Caracas, you see how somebody dresses, you see how they talk, and you can maybe they tell you where they went to school, and you right away can even if yeah. you don't want to, even if you're not judging, you can say okay they fit this box or that box. Yeah. But here in the U.S., I have no idea. There's so many schools, so many accents, so many different places that you have no idea if they're, what class they're coming from or, or how educated or what does it mean if they went to this school, to this other school. So, and of course, in your case, it's way more challenging because there's way more cultures, different languages, transitions. So how do you, and you mentioned empathy, but how do you navigate that? How do you know, okay, in work, maybe this person, I need to explain a little bit more with this other third person, I can be super direct. Um, yeah, yeah so, so, so it's all about uh, communication and, uh, and really make sure that the message is under, understood on, on, on the other side, right? So, and expectations as well. So basically, if uh, you know that as, um, if you have a certain nationality, that their way of explaining, if, if it's more with context, let's say, 
uh, they start with a, a lot of explaining. Maybe it's, it's not as straightforward as, uh, of, um, to say, hey, we have to go to, from point A to point B. But they, they instead of doing the, the straight line, they go in rounds and rounds. So okay. then you have to adapt. OK, how are we going to improve that to make sure that that communication is effective? And then that's my job, let's say, as, as, as a leader, or as, as a manager of, of the team, say, hey, Next time when we have a, 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 a meeting where everyone is involved and we have 10 people in, in that meeting, we have to make sure that that message is super straightforward because if not, people will get confused. So, so in the beginning, what I try to make sure is that everyone is in the same page. And many times I have to be the one that is translating a message or have to ask the question again. So everyone really understands what, what is going on. So, and for me, what I've seen that the formula in the end of, of how Dutch people really explain things is actually efficient for everyone to quickly be uh, in, in the same page again, right? So it's to start with that, with communication. And then as I said, with expectations as well. So what do we expect from you and what do you expect from, from your job? And then how can you do that and create a relationship that will create also um, high performance or that will create uh, deliveries that will, that person will deliver because any nationality. So if I, if I, if, if I give feedback to, uh, and let's say to a Venezuelan or to an American, mm -hmm. it's not going to be the same feedback. I can give it maybe to an Indian or a Chinese. So, First, I have to adapt. I have to see also the personality of that person because that also involves a lot of uh, how it's gonna be the conversations. And then I can really make sure that whatever is needed, it's, it's gonna be possible, right? So that's, that's how we start. So you try to build some kind of a strong uh, um, relationship where you can then really then uh, um, expect they can deliver and they, that we are in the same channel. So that, that's how I, I think that's how I've managed so far. And it, it's been, and so far it's been working, they say. That makes a lot of sense. And, and it goes in line with, with that line about empathy. And I've noticed that, and probably this is another tool that, that you use to accomplish that, right? To make sure that everybody's on the same page and matter their culture. But in preparation for the call, I noticed that you have, you mentioned OKRs in yeah. your LinkedIn profile. Uh, it's a book that I read a while ago. I loved it because I think it combines, you know, that you have this school of thought of, I think it started with IBM of set small goals, set achievable goals. So you are yeah. not afraid to do them. And you just, it's something super measurable that you know you can achieve. Um, and then you do it and you get motivated and that builds momentum. And then you have, on the other hand, I think it's, um, Jim Collins, big hairy audacious goals. Yeah. Set it 10x. It's gonna motivate you. Even if yeah. you don't achieve it, go for it. And I think the OKRs methodology merges both. You have that big objective that can be a dream, and then you have the the, the key results that are gonna keep you in line. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you came across OKRs. Was that something that the company was doing, and you just adopted that methodology? Or was it something that that you, I know you read a lot and, and we'll probably talk about that at some point, but was that something that, hey, I read the book, I think this is great and I'm gonna implement it with my team and then see where that takes us. Yeah, so OKRs at the beginning, uh, so when I started, I was not a big fan of the OKRs because basically it was not aligned between the teams. So you can create your own OKRs, but then actually, to be honest, uh, you're gonna depend on depend on other teams, so that that happened a lot, let's say, and in, uh, in the last uh, few years. But what I've seen is that basically we have learned uh, in that process, and I would say, okay, well, as you said, what is that big heritage, uh, uh, you know, objective that you have? Uh, but also, yeah, that uh, uh, point of the horizon, you know, and moonshot that you have. All right, let's do that. For example, let's say. Uh, I do pricing and then it's a, the, the, a dynamic pricing, right? Let's make sure that everything is dynamic pricing. We do pricing as an Amazon, right? Well, that's uh, okay. Yeah, moonshots. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you have the OPRs where, yeah, you have, you have to really align with our teams. And then you also have to make sure that those OPRs that you set 
also motivate your team to see exactly that you are delivering something and that you are achieving that. So it, it, it was a learning phase of how to really, yeah, let's decide which are those OKRs that can really are ambitious at the same time, but at the same time uh, achievable. So uh, now uh, you can see that more departments are really talking uh, or teams are talking with each other. Uh, uh, the management team is also looking into that to make sure that all the dots are connected. And yeah, what are we gonna do is really also will create an impact. So the question is always like, how can we go 10 times faster, right? How can, you, how can we go times 10? So well, mm -hmm. if you have that in your mindset, then you can really create those OKRs and let's go short term because we've learned also that you can't go long term and, and because then you lose the path. So where, where are you going? So let's go short term, things that we really can do short projects or small project projects that can really already deliver some impact in the short term. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to learn there. I think yeah. <laughs> I think even when he goes, when John Doerr goes and consults, he even tells companies that it's going to be, even when he's consulting with them and he's the expert and he's done it so many times, he tells them that it's going to be uh, a, a process. So, that makes total sense. And Andres, you mentioned something key there um, about that objective of having dynamic pricing. That's that's another topic that I wanted to talk about because we, I think we connected with the, the book that we were talking about, Confessions of the Pricing Man. We connected a while ago over that book on LinkedIn. And of course, in my case, I've, I've learned a lot from that book and I've tried to apply it to what we do and to the services that we do. And of course, it's super simple because we don't have that many products in, in that many countries, but I try to apply some of the methodologies. But in your case, you have to set pricing for eight plus countries. And I don't know how many products, I think I saw it in, in, in your LinkedIn profile, probably millions of, of, of different uh, stock key units. <laughs> yeah. So how do you do that? Yeah, it, it, it's tough. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, and, and that's why I like it. <laughs> but uh, I always say that you have to have three strong pillars to make that possible. So as you said, it's super challenging when you have to price more than eight countries, more than 700 products, more than 10 million SKUs. So for me to make pricing successful, you have to have the three pillars. One is business. You have to understand your business model. You need to understand what is the vision and the mission of the company. What is that message that you are uh, sharing with the customer. So if the message is, yeah, we, we are, we're the cheapest in the market, well, that's super straightforward. So we have to be the cheapest in the market. But if, you, if your message is, no, we, we are gonna offer you the best price, well, what is the definition of the best price? So if you understand the business, then you can already take decisions, strategic decisions, uh, uh, how to price your products or how to price in the different shops that you have or the different customers that you have in the different countries that you have. Then it's data because, yeah, we're a data-driven uh, department. So what we do is try to make sure to really base our decisions on data, seasonality, trends, how's uh, the profitability going, how's the revenue going, the conversion rate. So it's an e-commerce, so the conversion rate, the traffic, how's all, all those prices that we change, what is the impact of that in, into our, uh, in our business? And then technology. So of course you need to have a pricing tool that you can trust that will generate prices for those 10 million SKUs that basically you can trust and put them, put them live on the website according to the rules that you want to put. So you have many variables, you have a super complicated algorithm with all the variables coming from all the different kind of uh, suppliers and products and countries and carriers, et cetera. Uh, you, but you have to make sure that the algorithm is working and that the pricing tool is also fast enough to generate that price that you want to, to set up and that will make you convert and make you grow and, you know, and, uh, and make uh, customers happy. As I said, pricing should be the last prices, should be the last ex excuse of the customer not to buy uh, from our site. So, um, so that, that, that's, my, they say that's, that's my role. So leading that pricing strategy, make sure that we have these strong pillars and then, uh, and yeah, and then move forward to the to to even more stronger steps and higher steps. And this, this is a great topic because usually people are afraid 
to talk about money. It's in different mm -hmm. cultures. It's it's a topic that not a lot of people want to talk about. And usually talking about pricing, it's even more uncomfortable because talking about money is one thing. But then when you talk about pricing, it's usually in a negotiation where people feel it's a zero sum game, right? Like if I charge you as much as I can, I'm winning and you're losing. If I charge you the minimum, I'm losing and you're winning. And, and of course, we've seen that that's not always the case. So if you're thinking about, let's say you were brought in to help a business out there as a consultant to set up. And I know this is a tough question because it could mean different things. If it's services, if it's a, if it's a luxury um, yeah. product or service, but if you could boil it down to two to three fundamentals on, on how to set price, whether you are somebody selling professional services, maybe consulting or coaching, whether you are selling, I don't know, uh, um, online course, or whether you are just a big corporation and, and you can set prices, what would be the, let's say the Andres Gonzalez manual to setting prices for a business? Yeah, so I believe it all starts with uh, understanding the, your customer, customer needs. So then you can see, okay, you have to really treat your customers in a different way, depending on what, yeah, what they need, what, what they want. So um, what I've been trying to do, but it's hard, is to really um, like catalog different kind of products. So put it in, into kind of portfolios, right? Put it in a group. So you have, as you said, those premium products, uh, value, um, you know, the, the, yeah, those products where you can price with uh, value because in the end, uh, you're the, the only one in the market offering them. So yeah, if uh, you know that you have the best uh, online course that no one is offering, and it's already uh, yeah, uh, bringing a, a lot of impact or a lot of uh, um, improvement to that person that wants that online course. Yeah, for sure, let's go. And then you can really price your, your, those products higher. But then you have also products where you have to understand what, the com co what your competition is doing. So that is more like, okay, well, with, with those products, let's make sure maybe that we go low into uh, lower than them because we know uh, that there's a lot of competition going on outside uh, it's uh, also maybe a price sensitive kind of a, of a product. And then we know that if you go lower, people will convert and then this will create you more orders revenue uh, in the long term. But then you have also products where basically you know that your cost is uh, super low uh, and even compare with your, uh, with your competitors, you can go uh, uh, almost uh, exactly like them but because you have such a gap into your cost and, and, and your price that you can even play with discounts, let's say. So you can say, okay, well, let's do a kind of a promotion with a strike or let's do a promotion every, every now and then. So then you can also play with that because you have that gap. Again, you can breathe there that, uh, the, the, with, with, that, um, yeah, with, with those products, let's say. So I believe that if, if, if more or less if you categorize that and I'm going super simple, but if you do like that, most probably you're also going to win the game because that, that's the way of, uh, I always say that this is like a marathon. So if you're going to go for a sprint in a price war, or if you're going to go for a sprint in a, and let's see if this is the best price for the next month. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's not going to work. It's a marathon where you have to really make sure that you're prepared. You have the best shoes that you have to train that you know exactly which is the pace that your competitor is going. And then you have to really make sure that you don't want to, uh, lose all the energy at the beginning, let's go with the same pace, but always make sure that you're gonna win in, in, in the end of the road. Uh, and that will make your, in the end, that will make your also business prof profitable because that's the challenge in the end. I always say that pricing is like, a, a first you have a price, customer service will call and say, hey, what is that price? That price is too expensive. Can you lower the price? Can you lower the price? And then finance will call you, hey, what is going on with that price? That price is too cheap, or the profitability, and then you have to increase the price. So you have to find that sweet spot, right? And, and that's what it makes it uh, super dynamic and uh, super challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, such a great topic. We're super data-driven in our business. I like numbers, so we, we 
count everything to have an idea of how everything moves. But I want to get your thoughts because you mentioned something. You mentioned discounts. And, and there's a great example in that book where he talks about how, I think it's Mercedes, how they left, I don't know how many millions on the table because they mispriced a car. They had a new version of a car and, and they mispriced it and they left millions on the table because people were willing to pay more. They sold out. And then there was another example of, I think it was Ford. I don't remember which brand, but they were trying to, to get more cash flow. So they did a discount on the cars and they sold a lot and they thought it was successful. But then when they saw their, their typical, which is another point you talked about seasonality, they saw, oh, we didn't sell more. It's just the people that used to buy in August, the, the usual bump we used to get in August every year, they just bought a little bit earlier because we had this promotion. So we didn't generate more demand. We just sold it cheaper to the people who were already going to buy. And, and this is something, maybe this is for anybody listening out there. Here's a trick to getting um, cheaper prices. But I've noticed, for example, that um, sometimes, because you got to get, you got to get people, people have to have the money, they have to have the problem, and they have to have the ability to make a decision to be able to convert and create a customer, right? Um, so I've noticed, for example, in a lot of um, software as a service, a lot of subscription and in, in many other online type businesses that if you subscribe, I notice because usually when I wanna buy something, I just go to the website, I buy it. And usually you get subscribed to the emails and then you would get kind of like their email chain, which is automatic. And then you would get a discount. And I was like, why didn't I wait? So I've learned that if you want to buy something and you can wait, just subscribe, do the free trial. Don't buy it at the end. And then you'll get seven days later or 30 days later, probably because they know their conversion rate is higher when somebody has tried it. Then wow. you'll get like first year, get two months off. And now I know it's like clockwork. I want to try something. Let me just try it, subscribe, wait, they'll send. And they're they're losing money, right? Companies that are doing that because it's automatic. They're not even, I guess not everybody, like you said, it's Amazon that they can really hone in into everybody. But what would you say to people who are out there that say they are, they need cash flow and they're thinking about using a discount? What would what would you tell them to make sure that if they use a discount, they generate new demand instead of selling at a lower price to people who were already going to buy. Yeah, so that, that, that's uh, <laughs> that's super hard, right? So um, you have to be careful with the discounts. So uh, what happened? So basically we've learned, or well, e-commerce have learned, or that's what I've seen, that you shouldn't give things away, right? We, we were in a phase, I think some years ago, the premium uh, kind of uh, uh, thing, uh, more with products, no? Because okay, you have a, maybe Spotify that will give you 14 days to try it, or Netflix that will give you some days also to try it. Okay, that's different. But for products, like uh, I'll give example of the Vista, Vista Print. In the moment, uh, yeah, way back they were giving you free business cards or uh, free flyers and these kind of things. So first, you have to be careful with that. With, with that, uh, with, with what are you giving for free, right? Mm -hmm. uh, independent of the service. So that's super important. And then uh, what I've learned with the discounts is also, okay, you want to make them come back again. If you want to give them a discount, make sure first that you're not losing more money. So put a kind of a, put a max discount of that percentage of discount that you're giving. So it's more just a perception. So if you're going to give a 50% voucher, be careful because if you're gonna sell uh, 1,000 euros of a uh, product, then you're losing 500 uh, euros uh, there, right? Or dollars. So you really have to be, be careful. Okay, what is that max discount, and what is exactly what you want to get from that customer? And that, and then a, a good strategy that actually, uh, yeah, it is it, difficult to apply, or depending on of, of the business or the complexity of the e-commerce, is to make sure that well, maybe you have some kind of a cash. Uh, of your own uh, of your own site. So what I mean with that, okay, I give you a fifty percent uh, discount. That max value is uh, fifty dollars, and I will give you those fifty dollars as a cash for your next uh, purchase, right? So these are kind of a tactics that I believe they can work. If if your business in the end is you need people to come back maybe every two or three months, 
again, if you're gonna uh, sell shoes, it can be the case that people would just buy shoes once a year. Okay, well, you also need to understand exactly, okay, what is the lifetime of, uh, of, of your customer? How many times do they need the product that you're selling? Um, and then also, and that's in, in, the, in exactly you said it, what is that is right behind uh, giving that discount the first time uh, you subscribe to your email? Or what is that discount that you're giving? For example, everyone's going to wait for that Black Friday or everyone is going to wait for mm -hmm. that uh, Prime Day in Amazon, for example. So, yeah, what's exactly that value of the, uh, how much are you willing to lose in that Black Friday? And if you're willing to lose X amount of money, okay, make sure that that is going to be a loyal customer as well. So maybe they can come back and not wait until next November, for example. So um, that will be, I think, a recommendation for the, let's say, more uh, if, if you're working in this kind of department. And then what I, I well, I'm not obsessed, but I really am into the, trying to look for discounts and pricing and understand the, all the e-commerce, e-commerce, how they deal with, uh, yeah, with their own prices. So you can see how you can go to uh, your phone and you have one price, you have a Mac, you have another price, and then you have a PC and you have another price at the same moment. So I always recommend to everyone, check prices in all the devices that you have, and then check even in the device of your friend, because most probably you're going to find the same shoe, maybe 10 euros uh, or $10 uh, more uh, cheap. Wow. So you're saying that they know that, for example, that Apple users are more affluent customers, and in an Apple device, it's going to be more expensive than? can be. So wow. can be, or, or they're just doing an A-B test. So basically what they're doing is trying to see which is the price where people is converting, where people is buying. So it, wow. it can be that randomly the test that they're doing and uh, is that, okay, for every uh, Apple, uh, so for every iPhone, we're going to put X price. And, and again, it's not that it's going to be higher or lower. We're going to put X price. And for uh, if Android, put X price. And for people that is connecting in X uh, place, another price. Whatever. So, wow. Man, so, that's so smart because you can get Basically, you're getting every customer at their maximum. Like if we go back to our <laughs> economics days, you're getting every customer at the at the demand curve, right? Yeah. Like you're getting at the top of the demand curve because you're you're getting the maximum. And that's of course, I imagine you need a lot of technology to do that, but but that's yeah. smart. But yeah. you need a lot of technology and a lot of data as well to make sure that that price that you're setting is the best price so not every business can do that so you need to have so, so it can be a statistical um how do you say um, um relevant or I, I don't know exactly mm -hmm. that's a technical word but basically to, to make sure that uh, that 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 price is the best price you need correct x amount of data so yeah. again it's not the best practice but however you can see it so as, as from a consumer side hey wait i'm gonna go to uh, Salando where you can buy anything and clothes and shoes and everything. And I'm going to check what is going on in the different uh, devices, wait another day as well. And then maybe you can see some differences. Mm. Well, same, same thing with flights, right? So with the uh, prices of the flights are also different. And that goes more with the uh, demand, again, how many people are searching that same flight. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and it's crazy how, I think it's Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that he says, you just got to set up some rules about what you buy and you don't buy because if not, they're going to get you kind of like the, the extra insurance that they sell you in, in tech uh, stores that you don't need it because you have the, the, the warranty for a while. Um, of course, the way they frame it, they, they make you feel guilty. But I mean, it works. I remember, for example, Costco is super famous for, for doing that, for changing prices and, and understanding. I think there's a joke about the the hot dogs that they know they lose money on those, but the chairman said, don't ever think about touching the price of the <laughs> hot dogs because people, people come for the hot dogs. Yeah. Um, yeah. They also have, which is funny how psychology works because say what you mentioned about giving a discount bunny in credit, that's brilliant. And Costco did that to us. We bought a, an AC and they gave you the discount in a card in it's funny because it's our money, but it felt whenever we went to Costco to buy, you feel you're not using your money because it doesn't go out of your account. It goes out from this card that they give you that it's kind of like a gift card. 
So yeah. psychologically, it you don't feel it's coming out of your monthly budget. So it feels like free money, but you paid for it because you paid yeah. for the for the AC and the discount. It's it's your money. But uh, but yeah, that's 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 really good. Um, yeah, with with discounts, that's tricky. It's super tricky, and I still don't know how the the Black Friday and Cyber Monday make sense. I really don't know. I imagine those companies know, they probably know lifetime value and they really understand that, hey, if you buy this thing, you'll buy 10 other things down the line. But but it is because I do wait for some things. If it's a, a tech thing that I know it's going to, I don't, small things, but big things that make sense. It's like, yeah, let me wait and see if the, I can get this monitor or, or something that that's going to be worth it. Um, Seth Godin talks a lot about that. He says, don't do discounts, do free or full so that you don't have to negotiate in the middle, right? I do, and that's different because it's services, but he says, I'm gonna do full price. And if you can't pay that, maybe if you're a nonprofit or something else, I'll do free. So I don't have to, to negotiate, but then it's gonna be on my terms. It's gonna be, maybe I have a lot of more um, intellectual freedom in, in what I'm gonna talk about. In his case, I think it's speaking engagements, but, um, but yeah, any any other, for example, I learned uh, with the anchoring, that's something that um, I do now. And with discounts, we'll have to edit this part so our clients don't see that we, we actually get discounts. But if we do, for example, if I try to do it on the discovery call, if I see that price is, if, if my intuition tells me that the price is the element that um, is stopping them, I do it on the call so nobody else is going to see that. And then I also know in, my, in our case, we've been working with some clients for three or four years. So I know that it's just going to be one year, right? I'm basically building my pipeline um, yeah. for the next year. Um, anything, anything else you can think about in terms of pricing? Uh, I know, for example, McDonald's and, and those fast food companies are super smart in the way they set their bundles, that they put fries, $4.00 hamburger four dollars but um combo 6.5 and everybody thinks they're being so smart in in doing so um any other any other recommendations in terms of pricing that you could make for that person who's running their business somebody who has um, influence on how to set prices that you would say hey this this other one two three recommendations would would help you make more money yeah so that's the classic one of the bundle so that's also super smart to do uh, and then for sure, you're going to increase that AOV. So the average order value of your customers. So uh, that's also something that if it's easy already to, for you to implement, go for it. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, the, the bundle one that you said, and then uh, the ex classic example of the, of the wine. Uh, so you go to a restaurant and then you have a wine for uh, 10 euros and an hour wine for uh, 25 euros. And basically, yeah, you always will sell the one of the 10 euros because, yeah, 25 is much. But however, if you put in the menu that wine of 80 euros, then people will think that that uh, wine of 25 euros, oh, wow, well, mm -hmm. it's not that expensive. So, yeah, let's uh, try to, to buy more uh, than one of the 25 euros. And so always try to play with that. And have, if you have a good proposition, good assortment, and you can provide that already those uh, those options to your customer. Most probably, you can make them uh, already yeah, unconsciously uh, make them select that uh, option, that middle option, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's a good one. And, and I would one thing also to yeah, to read is the Economist uh, example of uh, when they have the um, so they, uh, so they, I, I don't exactly remember, but they were trying to give you the online version and the print version for an X price. And then basically uh, they, they were seeing that no one is buying the, uh, the print option because yeah, online 50 euros and, uh, and the other one was uh, yeah, a bit more cheaper. But then when you put both combined and you say 70 euros both, and, uh, and let's say 70 euros is uh, for free, the print version. And then people, ah, oh, let's go for, the, for both. And then you make even an upsell there. Um, so yeah, th th those are like a, also good uh, and interesting ways and methods of uh, creating more of that pricing psychology uh, yeah, thing, let's say. 
Yeah, yeah, we talk, we've talked a lot about that. I, what I usually recommend goes along those lines. I say the lowest price, and of course, I'm I'm kind of like in the service industry, so it's different. But I say price it at the lowest amount you would take and not be resentful to do the work, right? The, the most basic elements of the work that you need to do to make the client successful, to provide a good service, and a price that you're not going to be resentful. Then on top, do like 10x, 20x, whatever your ideal price would be, whatever you think you're worth, which is usually we think we're worth millions, yeah. put it put it up there, put it up there and, and add all the elements that you would want to do, right? Everything and anything. And then yeah. do the middle one, right? Like the middle one is somewhere in between that that it's kind of like, if you think about it, this is the, the low cost version. The top one would be the luxury version. Maybe it doesn't make sense sometimes, but it's just about two, three elements that you provide to nobody else. Um, and then you have your premium version in the middle that, that that's the one that you'll probably uh, get. Now, Andres, I've learned about this and, and this is something we, we share when we have in common, it's reading books. Um, I've learned all this through just devouring every pricing book and every business book I can and just trying and testing and seeing what works and keeping the data. Um, in your case, you have had a career through several different um, industries and, and several different positions. How did you become a thought leader? What were the steps you took to become a thought leader in pricing? Yeah, so um, it, it, it was not easy, I think. Um, took me a, a while and time to, under, to find exactly what I like. So to give a short stories, yeah, how, it's, how it all started. So I started in corporate finance uh, back in Venezuela, I did banking for two years in Venezuela. And basically when you saw that uh, banking was not my, my thing. So I saw many people working in banks and they were big fans of uh, what is happening there. And they were really into, into motivated into, wow, this is a, a, an amazing industry. And I didn't see that. So I, I didn't see myself like, okay, in 10 years, I don't see myself as uh, the VP of, uh, of this bank, because there's not much that got my attention in that sense, right? Then I, th then I went to, uh, to Barcelona, and in Barcelona, then I did accounting. So yeah, again, you start uh, in a new country, you start again, maybe from zero, and then start with more junior positions. And in that moment, opportunities was accounting. So well, let's do accounting, accounts receivable, accounts payable. And again, I, I didn't see myself in 10 years as that uh, coordinate accounting coordinator, you know, and, uh, and working into this kind of a uh, department where basically it was a lot of operational work. So, okay, that was good, but in the, it, I learned a lot. So that I, I, I learned a lot, but it basically it all started when I was in Vistaprint as an, an accountant and I was paying invoices, marketing invoices. And every time I was seeing invoices from Google, from Facebook, from Microsoft, and I was like, okay, wow, this is a lot of money. Where mm -hmm. is this? Like we're paying a lot of money each month to these guys. So what is this business making? Like how, how are we making money? And in that moment, I said, I need to do something different because I don't like accounting. And if I keep myself here, yeah, it, it will be always the same operational work that I, I really don't like. Uh, which, but which is important also for a company also. They, I learned that as well. And, and when I saw all these invoices, I, I, then I start you know, knocking doors in the different teams in Vistaprint. Uh, yeah, but uh, who is, how is this working? Where are we making money? And then uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to start master in, in big data and business intelligence because I believe I need to understand more, okay, what like a data analyst, maybe you have uh, some uh, potential there. And when I started doing uh, this data uh, big data uh, master, there was a position in the pricing team back in Vistaprint. And I said, hey, uh, I, I went to the director of pricing. Uh, you know, I saw this opportunity in, uh, in pricing. I think I can be a good fit. What do you think? We talked. And in that moment, he said, no, actually, uh, we're looking for someone more senior and with more pricing. And you come from accounting. Yeah. Maybe later, if there's an opportunity. And yeah, things happen for a, for a reason. Three, four months later, he uh, remembered that I was looking for that. And he said, hey, Andres, are you still interested in the pricing? And I said, yeah, well, uh, of course. 
And uh, yeah, so basically what happened was that uh, from accounting, I jumped to pricing. Uh, and it was because, yeah, due to the fact that uh, the director, but also my, uh, my previous um, uh, uh, yeah, former boss, let's say, that uh, he trusts in, in me in that sense. He said, yeah, he, you have potential in pricing. Yeah, let's do it. So what I wanted to do is to create impact with my decisions, really understand the business. And I had what the master gave me in big data was not the technical or coding part, was more to understand the richness of the tools to understand data. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can you do with, uh, with uh, the data visualization? What can you do with machine learning? What you can do with uh, all these kind of uh, new technology and softwares that are everything around. And then I said, okay, well, this is perfect. Then I was more in the business part, more taking decisions in the business part, but I understand more uh, that tech part. Uh, and that's how I started. I started as a junior in the pricing. And then I think uh, we created a super nice project. We were creating a new pricing tool. Uh, had a lot of potential. But there was a moment where I said, hey, I've been in six years in that moment of uh, working already. Uh, I had already two masters. So I really think I deserve a more senior position. And I was looking around the world positions where I can prove myself that I, I I can, uh, you know, that I deserve that senior position. And things happen for a reason. I, uh, I applied for a, a, a HelloPrint in Rotterdam for a position. And just to do networking. In that moment, there was no senior position, but just to do networking. And in that moment, by uh, yeah, coincidence, there was a, a senior uh, position as a pricing lead manager. And that was, uh, that was uh, the moment I said, okay, it was not an easy decision to do, but I decided to move to, to Rotterdam. Uh, I'm making this story super short because it took a lot of time to really to take that decision, uh, to really move from uh, Barcelona, where I was in a super mm -hmm. nice company, super nice position with uh, a lot of friends, but making that step to come to the Netherlands, new country, of course, new weather, uh, but what I can say that make it easier was that, uh, yeah, my two sisters, they live here in the Netherlands. So I said, well, I have family and I'm going to go for the challenge. Let's see. Yeah, I'm coming from a corporate to a scale up. Uh, let's see how it goes. They're going to have, they're going to give me a lot of responsibilities. Now I'm going to really, uh, my, I have to report to the CFO and to the CEO. So uh, yeah, this is not gonna be a, a game, and, uh, but let's go for it. I like challenges. And if I don't move, who's gonna move for me, right? So if I don't uh, create uh, you know, um, any movement in my life, uh, who's gonna do it for me? So that's when I said, let's do it. Let's take the risk. And well, so far it's been almost three years. And now basically still as a pricing lead manager and my team, I started managing uh, two uh, in my team. And uh, so far we're almost eight. So it's been uh, growing and uh, I'm super happy about that. It's, uh, it's something that if someone thinks about pricing in, in, the, in, the, in the company, yeah, they think uh, about, uh, about me because in the end I'm the one leading uh, that, uh, that uh, part. So I find it super challenging, but uh, super also like uh, give me a lot of energy, right? Mm -hmm. that is, that, that's a journey that's not easy to navigate changing, you've changed, um, let's say, your careers several times because you've been yeah. in different industries and in different positions. And then you find one where you clearly had a lot of value and they noticed because they were open to, to moving you to the, the pricing uh, position at Vistaprint. It's clear that he reached back to you, that you had good relationships, not only with your boss, but in the company. And then making this decision to go to a new country, uh, a different type of company in, in a different stage, uh, it, that's not an easy decision. So if, if there's somebody out there going through that same situation, right? Like, hey, I want to grow. I want more responsibility. I believe I can do it. But maybe the, that opportunity is not here in the company that I've been working at. What would you recommend them to do? What would be the two to three steps? I don't know. Make sure that the role is definitely not available in your current company. Um, no. What are some of the things that you would tell them to consider before making that decision? Yeah, so it's, um, you, you, you have, well, I, I'm super a uh, instructor and I, I really take 
many times, low risk uh, decisions, let's say. So in, in this case, it's yes, first, if you're happy where you are, yeah, really make sure that that other vacancy that you're looking for or that next step that you're looking for uh, is there. If it, see if there's an opportunity, right? So I always say, and this is for me is the more fair thing to do. So let's plan uh, my, my career development inside the company and let's create objectives. And if we reach those objectives, then fair for each of both of us, yeah, you deserve a promotion or you deserve a raise. And then let's go to the next step and let's then go to the next step. So that, that's the way you can trust also loyalty in, in, inside mm -hmm. the company. So if you can already have that relationship with, with your own uh, manager where you are right now, then that, that, that's the way how to, you, you should do it, right? So let's see if that's possible. If you're in this kind of a company where there's a glass uh, you know, ceiling that will, will make that impossible, yeah, now, now, now we're speaking in our language, mm -hmm. and then it's, hey, go out there, start applying everywhere, practice interviews, because that's something that I will always recommend to everyone. It's not about looking for the perfect job. It's, not, it's also practicing what is going on in the market. How much are you value as well? So that can make you already understand, okay, how, uh, how is your position valued in, in not only in the country where you are, but outside other countries? Because that can also give you a kind of a, a, a context to, or, or that can create also come of awareness to the company where you are right now and say, hey, wait, maybe I'm undervalued here. And in other companies, look what they can offer me and which responsibilities. And I'm not talking also, not only about salary, eh, but also about responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will recommend that, apply everywhere and it, it, it don't limit yourself to find that perfect job uh, because that's classic mistake that we also do. So we always look for that specific job and that is specific role, but you, you, I can say for experience that many of the jobs that I have applied have never been a job that I've uh, uh, ever had. In the end, that connected to another job in the same company and even a better one. Mm -hmm. So it's always opening yourself to, yeah, understand the company, under, uh, uh, sell yourself in, in, in that interview, and maybe they will find a lot of potential that say, hey, wait, but basically this, this guy shouldn't work in this department. Actually, we can take him to this other department and he, he can bring or she can bring more value. So that will be an, an, another tip for sure. And then, uh, yeah, and, and then also it's all about stability, right? So if you're already in, in a position where you can uh, take this risk and, 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 and you can also should negotiate that this will be a risk that in the end, that if things goes wrong, you at least are being, you're gonna, you have your safety net. Mm -hmm. So you should also ne negotiate that. So what do I mean? And yeah, if you have an indefinite contract in this company with that uh, glass ceiling uh, with, with, in, in that company where you know that you can't grow and you're going to another company, tr try, try, of course, to find that also maybe indefinite contract or try to find a way that they can retribute how, all the years that you've been working in this other company. So then you have that safety net that if things goes wrong and they can go wrong, then yeah. you can, you, you, you are okay, right? And then you can, okay, well, let's go back to the country where I was before, or let's go try to knock the door to that company again and say, hey guys, uh, I want to go, I want to come back. Uh, and you can only do that. It's also, also if you go from the front door, right? If you go mm -hmm. in, and you're always transparent. Um, so yeah, that, that will be my tip. Um, no. Those are all great points, Andres. And it's clear that in your case, it was because you wanted to make an impact. Um, yeah. I see that you're always talking about other things, not only about work. Um, I see how many books you read. I see that you're also involved in helping people be more healthy. And I like to talk about that, I think. I saw one of your Spartan race photos and, and we had a little chat about that. So would you talk to us, how is it that you're helping other people? So it's clear that you are pursuing health and it's important for you, part of your growth. How do you help others do it? Because sometimes it's not enough to just tell them, hey, this is what you could do or, or try to motivate them. It's not easy to, once you achieve it, to, to get others moving in the same direction. So would you share with us more about that, please. 
Yeah, so I, I always say that it's all about, uh, I always say, so it's one of my, I was a one or whatever you want to call it. So keep moving, right? So it doesn't matter what you do, but keep moving. Don't stay still. So with, what, with that, I mean that any sport counts. And what I try to do is to engage people to do the sport they like. So it doesn't matter if it's boxing, cycling, uh, CrossFit, tennis, go for a walk, uh, yoga, Pilates, whatever sport is, it, that you really enjoy, just do it. And then what I try to do is just also try to join that person and let, hey, let's go, no, let's, let's go together. And I'll try new sports because that's also something I try every year I try to uh, try new sports, whatever it is. And then if I like it, okay, nice. And then I keep doing that sport. If I don't like it, well, but maybe that person already feel like, a, okay, a bit of a motivation to keep going to, uh, to doing those lessons or to do more, more of that activity, et cetera. So it, it's about that. So I always say like, try to also build strong routines or, or strong habits, actually strong habits there where you're gonna, where there's gonna be a moment where you're gonna miss, oh, I didn't, de- I didn't do this mm-hmm. sport. So um, that, that's, I think, also the, the message I try to, 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 to share with, with my friends or colleagues. Uh, it's about, and here I always have like, um, and, and this comes from a cousin, right? So I have a cousin that is a trainer uh, in Canada. And then he started this movement of never skip a Monday. Mm-hmm. So I said, oh, okay, I, I, I like this. So I started doing that, never skip a Monday. And, uh, and then, uh, well, it's been now... 94 Mondays without skipping a workout. And as I said, 94 Mondays that everything counts. So if it's maybe I have to do 100 push-ups, or if I have to, uh, I'll go yoga or I go tennis or I go for a run or uh, a basketball, even like I haven't played basketball, but maybe I, I try a new sport. But then that Monday I did something. And with that, I also motivate people of never skipping a day. So I could never skip Tuesday, never skip Wednesday, never skip Saturday sometimes. And then just people make fun of me, but they are like, you see, I, I receive random messages from friends or from people I've never talked for years. Hey man, you're really motivating me to, to do something today. Or you really motivate me to keep going into my workouts. So that already makes me happy and say, yeah, okay. This is exactly also my kind of, um, yeah, what, what I like to do, let's say. And it really uh, makes me uh, yeah, motivated and, and gives a lot of energy. Yeah. Do you, are you posting about that? That's that's a great concept that never miss a Monday. Do you yeah. do you kind of like Yoko Willink uh, sharing all his workouts in the morning? Is that something that you do that you share it so that people get motivated and then yeah, have like yeah. a hashtag? Yeah. So basically, again, uh, because it's been already like yeah, like ninety four Mondays. It's not that I do it every Monday. But, uh, but what I do is, yeah, every, every two weeks, maybe, I, I, I never skip Monday, uh, X amount, nonstop. And then if I do a workout any other day during the week, I just put, hey, never skip this day. And then you see people that actually say, hey, I hate Mondays, but mm-hmm. you know what? I've never skipped a Tuesday, you know? So people go for a workout for Tuesdays and they have two months or three months without uh, skipping a Tuesday. So I really, really, I really got this from my cousin and it's like, uh, I think it's a super nice concept and, uh, and, and really can, you can see that really people will feel also like connected to that and then you create a kind of an awareness of that importance of sports because that, that's the other thing so my doing sports or doing whatever crossfit or something super high intensity uh, give me that's my, my like my meditation my mindfulness let's say mm-hmm. in that moment where I'm like almost dying, where my heartbeat is in 180, is where I'm starting thinking new ideas for work or for, or for friends or for my family. That's where I really start, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I know, being more creative. I don't know why, but that's exactly how, how it's working. And then after that, maybe in the moment you're suffering, and, but after that you feel so, so good. And well, you're also a super sporty guy, so you can, of course, I think you really uh, feel related with this. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's me. So what I did also last year, I got my certificate as a personal trainer. So mm-hmm. uh, basically what I've been doing with, with the company, with Hello Prince, is uh, also kind of a boot camp. So I do the boot camps as a, yeah, yeah again, as a trainer here in, a, in, in the company. 
So yeah, that gives me that 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 mix of working in business, startups, scale-ups, and also doing things with sports. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what uh, what I aim in in the, in the end to to keep doing. Yeah, it's health. It's a priority. No matter who you are, it should be. It's going to make your life better. And especially nowadays that I think in our time, we're probably going to be able to live comfortably beyond 100 years. If, you're, if you are a healthy person and if you take care of yourself, we'll probably be able to do so and, and still be active because of how technology is evolving. So definitely it's something important. In my case, I've been all over the place. I've been never miss any day for some years. I would train several times a day and no rest day. Now <laughs> I'm kind of like in the opposite. I'm, I'm more listen after I had a, an Achilles tendon rupture yeah. playing basketball. So after that, um, I definitely didn't want to be scared into not doing sports. So as soon as I recovered, I went out there and started doing sports and playing basketball again. But now I'm more mindful of, and of course we're older. We're we're yeah. not getting younger. Yeah, not totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now I try to listen more. Hey, if I if I have a weird pain in my back, okay, let me not do that lift heavy this week. Let me just do something to move around and 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 just move that lactic acid or, or whatever's going on there. Um, yeah. Also, ice bath. Um, after reading Wim Hof's book, yeah. I I bought an uh, a chest freezer. Yeah. And I'm almost doing it every day. And it's just magical. It's just, it, yeah, it's, it's something I else. I, we I can, need to try it. I think I need to try it. <laughs> yeah. This, this is something we could, we could talk hours about it, but I yeah, want to be yeah. mindful of your time, Andres. I know. So we've talked a lot about many different things and it's clear that you provide value, not only as a pricing lead manager at HelloPrint, but in many other ways. So how do you condense that when people, let's say you're at an event, um, uh, we haven't been doing much of those lately because of the pandemic, but let's say you are, you're meeting people, you're at an event in a professional setting and people ask you, what do you do? What is your typical answer? What do I do? Um, yeah, so what I do is uh, lead the pricing strategy, in this case of a header print, making sure that we have the best price in the market, trying to make sure that we grow not only uh, growing uh, as a, uh, let's say, so growing in a profitable way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The smart way. And always looking for opportunities to, yeah, grow 10 times faster and 10 times more. So, um, yeah, so I think that's what I do. And as I mentioned before, I really make, I want to make sure that we have those three pillars as strong as possible. Uh, and what I do believe is that you have to go step by step to reach the top. So if you have a ladder, you can't just skip them all at once. You really have to build strong foundations to make that moonshot, you know, to reach that moonshot that you want. So yeah, I believe that's that, that's what I do. It's, yeah, it's, it's a good question. <laughs> Andres, you've been in the printing industry for a while. Now mm -hmm. you are at Hello Print. What would you say if there's somebody out there listening to this, the millions of people that, that listen to our podcast, yeah. and they're thinking about, okay, I am thinking about printing something. I need to print something. Who should I go to? Then what would you say to them? What's your unique selling proposition? And why, why is it that people should pick you instead of any of the other printing options that are out there? Yeah, so basically... What I truly, truly believe that the business model that we have has a lot of potential. So we are a platform that we're trying to build the biggest platform of printing in the earth, right? So we're like kind of a booking.com, let's call it like that, of printing. So we don't have the factories, we don't have the printers. What we have is a big network of suppliers around Europe and also a big network of carriers around Europe. And we will try to find the best combination mm. to bring you the best product with the best price anywhere you are in, a, in, a, in Europe. So we can really play with that in the sense that we really make sure that we have those suppliers up to date, delivering quality, those carriers, they're, really mean, uh, they're delivering on time, that printing product that you want. 
And with that, that comes pricing, where it comes super important and essential, what, what will make you really buy from us, because then we're gonna give you the best price in the sense that we can really play with uh, and say, we can really manage and understand our different costs from our suppliers to make sure that we can also give you the best price in the market. So building this platform is huge. It's not easy at all, as, you, as we said, more than 10 million SKUs and that's just the beginning, but for sure has a lot of potential that it, in the end, you can really go worldwide if you create the right connections. connections. And listen, you're building this platform for who in mind? If you, if you would have to pick a persona for your ideal client, who is it that can take the most advantage of this platform that you're building that's going to get somebody the best price and distribution for yeah. whatever they need to print? So we, we have, uh, for sure, small businesses, small and medium businesses. So you have your restaurant, you have your store, right? You have a, a hotel, and then you really want to, yeah, create awareness of your brand. So you want to print your those flyers, the menus, the stickers, the flags, the t-shirts, your cap. So we have all of those products where you can create awareness to your customers. And in the end, you can already every now and then, depending on the seasonality, you can buy from our site and 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 adapt to whatever situation is ha is happening. Um, and then we have also uh, graphic graphic designers. When mm -hmm. actually these graphic designers have their own also portfolio of of customers, where they can also deliver them with quality and speed whatever they need for all these and let's say events when events comes back again or where we have event uh, yeah we, again events or or when you have the, those kind of a uh, um, launch new brand, uh, the, the new brand, or you have to want to launch a, a new uh, the, the new store that you have. So we are offering all of all of that. And now what we're doing, and actually it's super important now. Yeah, it's, it's 2022. It's all about also su sustainability. So we're trying to make sure that we also offer you the most sustainable option. And with that, I mean, yeah, let's try to go with uh, maybe um, recyclable um, materials. But it can also let's try to see, yeah, how can we make sure that whoever is going to deliver you that uh, product also will be the most efficient uh, carrier or the most efficient also supplier of that ink that they use, et cetera. So that's a big project that we're working on. But we all were aware of that, yeah, uh, that this is needed as well. Andres, I'm sure we could keep talking for hours. We didn't even get into the books topic. So. <laughs> maybe we'll have to do a round two, but I just want to thank you for your time, for sharing your insights with us. Is there, before we leave and, and find, finalize this episode, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? Any maybe call to actions? Is there, um, I know you, you talked about some of the posts you share to motivate people. Um, you talked about HelloPrint, anything else that you would like to make a call to action that we could probably add to the episode page and to the to the video when we share on YouTube that a, a resource or anything that you would think would be valuable for people listening to this episode. Yeah, so I think yeah, we, we, it's true that we talk about culture, we talk about pricing, talk about sports, but I think that's something that can really make the difference is creating those strong habits. So. And with that is, and as I said before, with the same metaphor of going into that maybe moonshot in, in pricing, but mm -hmm. in, in your life is the same. So if you really want to reach the top, you really have to make sure you really build those strong foundations. And to do that, I truly believe it's all about creating strong habits and uh, making sure that you can also influence others into, into this and make sure that in the end, it's all about helping others as well and uh, making sure that, uh, in, yeah, this is, this is a journey where you have to be also happy with it, right? So you have to make others happy and then you try to make sure that you have shared that positive energy every day. Because as I said at the beginning, it's all about empathy and understanding others and enjoying the ride. So with that, uh, I think that's, uh, 
an important message that I can share with everyone. And, and if anyone is also hearing this message of moving from other countries, uh, adapting to new cultures, yeah, it's not easy, but it's something that is super fulfilling. And it's something that's, yeah, it, you will never forget when you moved and how you lived in other countries and when you shared your culture with others and when others shared your culture with you. So that really makes you, or well, what I believe, even stronger and, uh, and uh, yeah, and happier in the end. Well, thank you very much for sharing that, Andres. I am grateful for having you here. This was a great conversation. I'm sure the audience is going to enjoy it. Thank you. Well, maybe we'll have to find some time to make a round two. And for everybody out there listening, thank you for being here with us in this conversation. And we'll see you in the next episode. Yeah, thank you very much, Alejandro, for the opportunity. Yeah, and uh, looking forward for the round two then. <laughs> Thank you for subscribing to the B2B Thought Leadership Podcast. It's our goal to help you become the go-to thought leader in your niche. That's why we do these interviews and we create the content. So if you want more of it, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and all the podcast platforms and especially subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click that subscription button, click the notification bell so that whenever new content comes out, you are the first to know about it. Thanks again and see you in the next episode.